So I'm Dr. William Davis. I'm a cardiologist in Milwaukee. I was very unhappy with the way things were going a number of years ago. So I was simply unwilling to accept this notion of take your Lipitor, cut your fat, and you're done. I know lots of people who had bypass surgery, three stents, and heart attacks following just that regimen. So I started asking questions. Well, why, why do people have, you think this would be clear as day, but it's not. Why do people have heart disease? And so it, just asking that very simple question pointed me down some new paths, and it took me down this path, and I'll show you why. So I call this wheat the unhealthy whole grain, or subtitled, Why We Are the Unwitting Victims in a Grand Genetics Experiment Gone Sour. And I'll tell you why I say such obnoxious things. We all know what that is, right? I'll bet you some of you uh, had that for breakfast. Toast, English muffins, or at least in your pre-wheat days, So I know some of you have read the book. Uh, bagels, how about low-fat turkey breast on two slices of whole wheat bread for lunch? How about low-fat pretzels for a snack? How about some wheat thins? How about some uh, whole wheat pasta and tiramisu for dinner? So we all know what this stuff is. It's 20% of all human calories. So what's the problem here? Humans have been consuming wheat for thousands of years, literally thousands of years. Why would I poke my point my finger at it? It's part of habit. It's in the Bible. It's part of tradition, it's part of holidays, it's part of friendship and sharing. What, what could there be wrong? Well, I want to dispel some myths. The myth for me is healthy whole grains. So bats are not blind. Lemmings really don't jump off of cliffs. Bananas don't grow on trees, they grow on vines. Scientology is not about science. And humans have no business eating grains. So let's talk about that. So we're going to talk about why I say these kinds of obnoxious things. I realize how obnoxious and provocative and polarizing even this can be. But I'm going to argue that this stuff is not only not good, it is very destructive. So in order to gain some perspective on why this might have occurred, let's go back, way, way back in time. So if we go back 10,000 years, somewhere around 8,500 BC, this, these were the years just after the last ice age pulled back and temperatures rose worldwide. That allowed fields of grasses, grains to, to emerge. And humans back then were hunter gatherers. They would hunt animals, fish, gather seed, nuts, berries, mushrooms, insects, reptiles. And we having dinner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> but they noticed this grain, this grass, that animals would eat. Wild goats would eat it for it. Wild sheep would eat it. So they thought, well, let's give that a try ourselves. Well, you can't eat raw grass, by the way. It makes you very ill. So they learned how to use this, grind it down with stones, and make it into a parch. It's not quite clear how they were talking about 10,000 years ago. We're not even sure if they knew how to cook it or how they heated it, just the, the, the precise means by which they did that. But somehow they incorporated wild wheat, the ancestral form of wild wheat, into their diet. Well, this ancestral wild wheat that grew just in fields in the Middle East was called Einkorn. Now, I won't bore you silly with talk of chromosomes and genes and those sorts of things, but if I picked a very nice lady out of the audience, how many chromosomes do you have? 46. How about a six foot two Maasai tribeswoman from equatorial Africa who lives on the blood of cattle? 46. How about a, how about a, um, an Aboriginal woman standing four foot six, uh, dark kinky hair, um, who lives in the outback of Australia. 46. So despite extreme or, or very striking outward differences, we all share 46 chromosomes. Not one single person here tonight has anything but 
46 chromosomes. <laughs> okay, so einkorn, the, the ancestral form of wheat that grew wild and humans harvested by hand, 14 chromosomes, okay? I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, uh, so plants have the peculiar capacity to mate with each other and combine chromosomes. When you have children, dad has 46 chromosomes, mom has 46 chromosomes. Do your children have 92 chromosomes? No, right? So your chromosomes mix and your children have 46 chromosomes likewise. Well, plants can do something odd. They can, mommy plant, daddy plant, plant can mate and the offspring plant can have the combined chromosomes of mom and dad. Okay, it's called polyploidy. Well, einkorn, somewhere probably around 6,000 to 8,000 years ago, wild einkorn mated with a wild grass, which contributed another 14 chromosomes. And so einkorn plus this wild grass yielded what's now called emmer wheat. Okay, emmer wheat is the wheat of the Bible. I make that point because a common comment I hear is, well, but wheat is in the Bible. It's, it fills the Bible, by the way. It's used for metaphor for salvation, for times of plenty, etc. It is in the Bible. But it ain't what you got. It's emmer wheat, this 28 chromosome offspring of wild einkorn wheat that mated with this grass. Okay, let's fast forward to the Middle Ages. We're still way, way back in time. So bread was a staple back then. It was often the staple of the wealthy, but the poor also wanted it. And there are many forms of bread, but bread was a very common food in the Middle Ages. Well, what was that? Well, as, as plants will do, emmer, again, made with yet another grass, which in turn con contributed 14 more chromosomes, yielding 42 chromosomes. And that yields the forerunner of what we have now the modern triticum species, okay? So I make these points to, to show you that what we have now is different, okay? So it's not einkorn, it's not ever of the Bible, it's not even the wheat of the Middle Ages, it's something different. Now it's been taken farther. How about 1960? So those of you old like me may remember the days where we were terrified, terrified of world population explosion, that we would have billions of hungry people in Asia and Africa, maybe even the US, because we had population explosion that exceeded the capacity for the world to feed them. So there was a very logical investment in agricultural research. So the US government, other governments, universities, foundations, etc., devoted a lot of money to exploring new ways to increase crop yield. So this is one such uh, research group. These are grown men standing in a field in Mexico City, east of Mexico City. Uh, the guy in the far right is Dr. Norman Borlaug. He's a geneticist trained at University of Minnesota. And they're standing in a field of wheat. These are fully grown men. Notice that this wheat is about shoulder high, right? So they, they started with traditional strains of wheat standing shoulder high. Well, Borlaug was a pretty hardworking, smart guy. And he used a variety of techniques, because he was kind of the guy who drove a lot of this. They repetitively crossed, mated different strains of wheat from different parts of the world with different characteristics. They would repetitively back cross them to try to select out certain characteristics. They would mate their wheat strains with other grasses to introduce unique genes. They would use different conditions to generate different characteristics. So thousands, literally thousands of genetic experiments to yield uh, 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 variant strains. And he was successful. So this is the cover of Life magazine from 1970. This was just after Dr. Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for this work. So he's holding several stalks of his high-yield semi-dwarf strain. Notice that you can't judge this from where he's holding his hands, but notice that the stalks, that is the shaft, is very thick. Notice that the seed heads are really big and the seed 
head itself is very large. So this thing yielded four times more per acre, six times more per acre, eight times more per acre, as much as 10 times more per acre. So uh, for that reason, when this was introduced into the third world, like Pakistan or Bangladesh, uh, famine was converted to surplus within one year. So Borlaug was hailed as a hero for helping develop this high yield semi-dwarf strain of wheat. Okay? Very different outward appearance, very different yield and other characteristics. Doesn't end there. Oh, by the way, this is my, this is my stepson. Uh, he was 13 at the time. So this is about five miles from my house. I'm in Wisconsin. And it's everywhere. So it's not as if this is only grown in one place. This stuff has essentially taken over the world's wheat supply because it was so incredibly prolific. That is, if you're a farmer and you're getting, let's say, eight bushels per acre and your next door neighbor is using this other strain of wheat from seed he purchased and he's getting 85 bushels per acre, how can you compete? So in a competitive world, uh, you adopt this high yield strain. So the world has essentially uh, lost the older forms of wheat and have adopted this high yield semi dwarf strain of wheat. And this is the field just a couple of miles, just a few miles from my house. So this went on farther. Uh, this is an example of uh, something that's sold widely and grown widely in about a million acres now in the Pacific Northwest called clear field wheat. Let me tell you what clear field wheat is. It is a semi dwarf strain of wheat. So it is just like the stuff that Borlaug came up with, but they did some things to it. They exposed the seeds and embryos to a chemical called sodium azide, which is an industrial toxin. Let me tell you about sodium azide. Uh, there have been instances of accidental human ingestion and the poison control people say, if you witness an accidental ingestion, don't offer that person CPR. In effect, let them die. Because if you offer them CPR, you're going to die too. And if the victim vomits, don't throw the vomit in the sink because it may explode. And that has actually happened. So you take this chemical, sodium azide, you expose wheat embryos or seeds to it, and you induce mutations. This is, the, this is an ad from the BASF Corporation that is the patent holder of Clearfield Wheat. It is the product of enhanced traditional plant breeding methods. So what they've done here is they said, hey, our clear field, now grown on a million acres in the Pacific Northwest of the US, is not the product of that nasty genetic modification business. We only used enhanced traditional breeding methods. Okay, so this is the game. This is the game that agribusiness has been playing with you, that uh, yeah, wheat is not genetically modified. That's true. In the language of genetics, no gene splicing techniques were used to insert or remove a gene. Instead, these other techniques, like multiple crossings, back crossings, uh, embryo rescue, chemical mutagenesis, that's what this is called, the purposeful induction of mutations using chemicals, gamma mutagenesis, High dose X ray mutagenesis. This is, this is using gamma rays and X ray to induce mutations. These are the techniques used that predate modern genetic modification. Very imprecise, crude, unpredictable techniques that are far worse than modern genetic modification. So I'm no defender of genetic modification, but the techniques of genetic modification are actually a substantial improvement over the techniques used to generate a lot of the older crops, including 40 years of wheat. So what does our USDA do with this? They tell us, eat more of it, right? So we're told that wheat and grains, they, they say grains, they don't say wheat, right? But how many here have had a breakfast of triticale? <laughs> How about sorghum or millet? Well, all right, this is a smart crew. Uh, for the most part, when we talk about wheat, right, in North America, certainly, I'm sorry, when we're talking about grains, we're really talking about wheat for the most part. So over 90% of all grains consumed is wheat. So uh, when the USDA says eat more grains, they really mean eat more wheat. So in the food pyramid, they advised us to eat about 60% of calories plus, 
from wheat, and the more uh, recent food plate, likewise. At least a quarter, more than a quarter of the plate occupied by wheat. So this thing conceived by people like Dr. Borlaug for good purpose, not evil purpose, to increase yield, help solve world hunger, taken further by agribusiness, and then sold and were told to eat more. Uh, well, why is that so bad? But let me digress just for a moment, make this point. So uh, we're going to talk about why modern wheat has a few things wrong with it. But what this is not about is being gluten free. I make that point right up front because, you know, I'm very grateful that I enter this this conversation at a time where gluten free is starting to become very, very popular, but for the wrong reasons. OK, so there are people with celiac disease that is intestinal destruction from the gluten, this protein in wheat. There's probably eight, nine or 10 percent of other people who have a lesser form of sensitivity to this protein called gluten. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking about the other 90 percent of people. OK, so uh, I'll make the point that no human, there's not a single human I've ever met who could get away with eating this thing created by the shenanigans of genetics, okay? But it's, it's separate from the gluten-free discussion in many, in many ways. So what's, what's so bad about this thing that Dr. Borlaug and BASF and all those people came up with? What's wrong with it? Well, let's talk about the protein gliadin. So gluten, this thing you've heard about, a protein in wheat is really a two part protein. It's got gluten in. You ever see a pizza maker do this, right, with dough? What else does that? Can you do that with corn starch or rice starch? No, <laughs> you have a mess, right? So the gluten in polymer has that unique, what the bakers call viscoelasticity. It gives that, that stretchy, characteristic that almost nothing else has. Well, that's the glutenin in wheat. Well, the non-stretchy protein is another protein in gluten called gliadin. And gliadin is the thing you want to, if there's one thing you and I take away from all this, it is there's something wacky about that gliadin. Well, back in the 70s, it became clear. There were, there were several psychiatric groups here in the UK who made this observation. If they take their patients, this, is, this was years ago, so 40 plus years ago, when, uh, you know, right now if you go to the hospital, you have a nice private room or semi-private room, right? Do you remember the days where there were 40 patients with you in the same room? <laughs> the big uh, hospital wards? Well, back in those days, the psychiatric hospitals had closed large wards. So their patients could not come and go as they pleased, and everything was controlled. Their medications were controlled, their diet was controlled. Well, several psychiat psychiatric groups back then made this observation. If they took all the wheat out of the diet of their schizophrenic patients, they got a bunch better. They weren't cured, but their paranoia, their hallucinations improved dramatically. They'd add back the wheat, they'd get much worse. There's over four week periods. They would uh, uh, take the wheat away, they got better. Add it back, they get on again, off again, on again, off again. This was reproduced a number of times. So the people at the National Institutes of Health asked, well, why? What the heck is in bread or pretzels or cookies that causes schizophrenics to hallucinate? So this group, led by Dr. Christine Zedrew, uh, boiled it down to the gliadin protein, that protein we're talking about. And this thing, upon digestion, enters your brain, and it acts as an opiate. It binds to the opiate receptors of the human brain. So the, the human brain is filled with so-called opiate receptors. That's not, that, that may not be the nature's intended effect, but that's how it plays out in real life. So if I take morphine, it provides pain, relief from pain. If I take heroin, makes me high, makes me goofy, and I can't control my thoughts or my behavior. If I take wheat or the gliadin protein, the breakdown opiates of wheat, I don't get high, I don't have pain relief, I only get appetite stimulation, okay? So it binds mostly to the kappa receptor and others. I don't get the other, those other effects, I just get appetite stimulation. 
So this is one of those opiate uh, uh, proteins from wheat. This, this is the A5 pentapeptide. This binds to the human brain. So this led, this, this observation that, for the most part, by the way, was not made much of. You didn't hear much talk about that in the 70s. Well, this led to a whole series of research where people asked, well, gee, if that's true, if wheat is an opiate, what if we give nice people opiate-blocking drugs? Not take away the wheat, that doesn't make any money. Let's give them opiate-blocking drugs. <laughs> so this is a small study where nice, normal people came into a laboratory, and they were told, don't eat breakfast. We'll feed you lunch and dinner. Okay? So they come in, they skip breakfast, and uh, they have lunch, and they, they're told, eat all you want. And if you look in that leftmost bar, that white bar, you'll see they took in about, those are calories, they took in about 1,000 calories. They waited several hours and then had dinner. And they're told, go ahead, eat all the dinner you want. And they ate about 800 calories. So about 1,800 calories. Well, these same nice people are brought back some time later, some weeks later. This time, same deal, but this time they get an injection of a drug called naloxone. Anybody who works in an ER or a hospital has used Narcan, naloxone, to reverse uh, unintentional overdose on morphine, for instance. It, it, it blocks the drug's effect within seconds. So it's an opiate blocking drug. So you give these people an injection of Narcan or naloxone, and they're told, go ahead, have all the lunch you want. Well, this time they eat about 700 calories for lunch. And then for dinner, about 700 calories for lunch, or about 1,400 calories over the course of the day, or approximately 400 calories less after injection of uh, an opiate-blocking drug. Okay? So uh, wouldn't you know, someone is enterprising on this. The FDA application was made about two years ago, still pending, for the drug naltrexone, which is the oral equivalent of naloxone. It's an, it's an opiate-blocking drug. And in the clinical trials, it reduces uh, calorie intake by about 400 calories per day. And people lose about 26 pounds over the first six months. These are non-heroin uh, addicted, non-morphine addicted. These are just ne normal everyday people who have a weight problem. And they're brought in, they're, they're given this drug, and they lose weight, even though they're not addicted to opiates. At least not the kind you take the drug form. Well, this is not proof of cause effect, but I find it very, very interesting. If you look at what's happened to Americans, North Americans, since this stuff made it to your store shelves. So this thing was invented in the 70s. You saw Borla getting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970, but it really didn't reach your store shelf till about 82 to 85 or so, okay? But by 1985, everything, everything you bought came from bread, Pasta cookies came from the high yield semi dwarf strain, okay, the spawn of Dr. Borlaug's work. So, what happened to weight? Well, you know. Anybody who watches the headlines know that starting in about the mid, early to mid 80s, we had an explosion in weight. You've been to Walmart, haven't you? <laughs> well, if I gain 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 70 pounds, what do I get? I get diabetes. There's a lag, right? I don't gain 30 pounds on Tuesday. I gain it all for months or years. So there's a lag between gaining weight, uh, having your appetite stimulated, gaining weight, and developing diabetes. So uh, the number of diabetics, of course, followed suit. And uh, these are data from the CDC only till 2009. If I include it till 2011, that is the last year for which we have data, you would see that the curve is now vertical. So now I can't prove to you cause and effect with these data, but I'll show you why I think it's very, very suspicious. It smells awfully bad that we've been fed an appetite stimulant. So wheat via its gliadin protein is an opiate. And by the way, uh, uh, there's a lot more to this gliadin because of the time a lot of I can't go into all of that, but it has other effects. So if it's an appetite stimulant, what does it do to people with a tendency with, uh, to a, an eating disorder, like bulimia or binge eating? It gives them food obsessions. What does it do to a child with ADHD or autism? It gives them uh, behavioral outbursts and difficulty with attention span. Uh, what does it do to a schizophrenic? Well, you know, it causes paranoia and hearing voices. What does it do to a per person with bipolar illness? It triggers the high, the mania. 
So it has mind effects, but in nice, normal, everyday people, it only stimulates calorie intake, appetite. Okay, let's talk about, let's glide in protein. Let's talk about blood sugar. What does wheat do to blood sugar? We're told to eat more of it, right? So what does that do to blood sugar? Well, you've heard of low glycemic index foods and high glycemic index foods, right? So high glycemic index foods raise blood sugar very high. Low glycemic index foods raise blood sugar less high, not low, less high. So where does wheat fall into that scheme? Well, if we look at all, I'm sorry about this slide, but look at all the years and years where this question has been studied all the way back to 1981, when Dr. David Jenkins, University of Toronto, generated these data, he just wanted to know what happens to people with diabetes when they eat different foods. So he took normal slender volunteers and fed them different foods. And he generated a curve for how much their blood sugar went up, called the glycemic index. So if you feed these nice skinny kids, sucrose, and they get a high blood sugar. No surprise. You feed people sugar, they get high blood sugar, right? So the glycemic index was 59 for sucrose. What was it for, whoops, for whole grain bread, whole wheat bread, 72. Now, this is the original slide, the original table from Dr. Jenkins from 1981, but it's been corroborated thousands of times since. It's in all the tables of glycemic index. Two slices of whole wheat bread raise blood sugar higher than six teaspoons of table sugar. Now, wait a minute, why would that be? Why in the world would healthy whole grains with complex carbohydrates raise blood sugar? Because all the dietitians and the nutritional community all agree, we should eat more complex carbohydrates and less and fewer simple sugars. Well, what they didn't tell you is the unique complex carbohydrate, complex meaning a long chain or branching chain as opposed to a simple sugar. So the complex, the so-called complex carbohydrate of wheat is something called amylopectin A. Amylopectin A has a unique branching structure that is highly susceptible to the enzyme amylase. You and I have amylase in our mouths and our stomach, and you put a piece of bread in your mouth, it starts to digest right away and raises your blood sugar. So it's uniquely digestible, as opposed, say, to the amylopectin C in beans, which is very inefficiently digested. And that's why you and I get, you know what, when we eat beans because we don't digest it, but the bacteria in our colon throw a party when they see that undigested <laughs> carbohydrate. <laughs> So different foods have different forms of amylopectin, but the amylopectin A of wheat is very unique and it's uniquely digestible, raises blood sugar sky high. So we have literally thousands of studies. This is what's astounding about a lot of this is, I wish I could tell you I'm the smartest guy around and nobody else can figure it. This is clear as day in the data the wrong questions were being asked. So there have been since thousands of studies showing that wheat raises, this is one such study from Finland, there's thousands of others. If you give people a uh, whole wheat bread, they have sky high blood sugars, sky high insulins. What does that do? So what if I have whole wheat bagels for breakfast and I have my wheat thins for a snack and I have my uh, low fat turkey breast and my two slices of whole wheat bread for, for lunch and, and on and on and on. So wheat for breakfast, wheat for lunch, wheat for dinner, wheat for snacks. What do I do? I have repetitive high blood sugars, high blood insulin. What does that do to us? What does that do to us over five years, 10 years, 20 years? It gives us visceral fat, right? <laughs> so, um, and you can even see that on a CAT scan, it's the fat, it's the dark black stuff that encircles the intestinal tract, the liver, the kidneys. It even, by the way, uh, and circles the heart, which is a, a terrible thing for your heart. So repetitive high blood sugar, repetitive high blood insulin, because of amylopectin A, driven further by the gliadin protein that stimulates your appetite, what do you get? Right? You get, you can see why I call it a wheat belly. Let's talk about lectins. <laughs> You know, I don't think this was all purpose. I think it was just a bu bunch of, a series of big blunders. But sometimes you, you hear all this, and by the way, this is the abbreviate, I, I can't give you, there's more. But um, it's as if a bunch of evil scientists got together and said, hey, how do we screw up these nice Americans, make them fat, make them hungry, and cause health? They would come up with wheat. It's as if they did not. There's no such thing, there was no such, 
my knowledge, a purposeful effort. It was just a series of incredible blunders, but you can see where this led, led us. So let's talk about lectins. So if, if, a, if a, a bacteria or a virus invades your body, what does your body do? It has immunity, right? You've got antibodies, lymphocytes, T cells. You have multiple layers of complex responses that fight off that invader. What do plants have? Plants don't have any of that stuff. They have something called lectins. Lectins are proteins that are toxic to molds, fungi, insects, etc. So they have a simpler form of immunity, of, of protection. Well, this is the uh, lectin of wheat. It's a four-part complex molecule. Um, lots of plants have lectins. Spinach has a lectin, but it's benign. So lots of lectins are in plants, and they might be harmful say, to a mold or a fungus, but they're not harmful to us. But ricin is also a lectin. So if you, if you follow the news, you know that about, about a dozen terrorist attacks have been made with the uh, lectin ricin. It's a neurotoxin. So some uh, lectins are benign, like in spinach. Some lectins are very toxic. They're fatal to humans who are exposed. Wheat germ glutenin is someplace in between. What happens if I isolate wheat germ gluten and give it to a laboratory rat? Well, in, it induces changes in the intestinal tract almost identical to celiac disease. So this is not gluten. This is wheat germ gluten. They sound kind of alike, but they're very different. So I give a milligram to a rat. It destroys its small intestine. Okay? And that's what the picture at the very bottom is. It lost those little fingers that line your intestinal tract, just like, just like people with celiac disease do. Well, you, no human eats purified wheat germ and gluten, but what does an average American who eats, you know, their bread and pasta, etc., how much do they get? 10 to 20 milligrams in an average day. So, uh, we have a, uh, uh, sorry about this complex slide, but we have this peculiar two-fisted effect of wheat. This was discovered in 1990, by the way, University of Maryland, Dr. Alessio Fasano. That gliadin protein we talked about has the peculiar capacity to unlock the normal intestinal barrier. So we have smart intestines. Believe it or not, your intestine's really smart. When you eat something, not everything that goes in here, particularly if you're a kid, right, should end up in your bloodstream. So the intestinal tract is smart, and it decides what should be allowed to enter your bloodstream. Well, the gliadin protein disables that mechanism. It, in effect, opens those tight junctions, the barriers between cells, and allows foreign substances entry into your bloodstream. That's the presumed reason why people who eat wheat have more rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and other autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. Well, it's a two-way street. So if you open those intestinal barriers, water can also get out. You get watery diarrhea. Okay? It doesn't end there. So the gliadin protein disables the normal intestinal barriers. It also allows foreign things through, such as wheat germ gluten. Okay? So gliadin joins the party, gliadin proteins, wheat germ gluten joins the party, and they get access to your bloodstream, and other foreign substances gain access to your bloodstream, all because of this effect that wheat has. So if, if you read the science that comes uh, from all this, that is this gliding effect of opening the, the intestinal barriers, you'll see that the scientists say, you know what? This seems an awful lot like cholera toxin. <laughs> Remember Haiti, the cholera, right? So this is a cholera hospital in Bangladesh. Uh, see those beds, the silver lined beds? You might notice there's a little hole in the bottom. That's where the diarrhea goes. Okay, so when you have cholera, you have such terrible, intractable diarrhea, they can't stop it and it just pours out of you, so they just catch it in a bucket underneath your bed. So uh, the scientists who have done this work say, you know what, the gliadin protein in wheat is an awful lot like cholera toxin. So what does that do? If you allow the entry of foreign substances into your bloodstream because of that gliadin effect, wheat germ gluten effect, and the inflammatory, you get bowel inflammation, you get irritable bowel syndrome, bowel urgency, watery diarrhea, acid reflux, uh, worsening, not cause, but worsening of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. You get inflammation of joints. The most typical joints inflamed from wheat are the fingers and wrists, elbows, followed by shoulders, and then the big joints, less commonly, but still can be inflamed. You get inflammation of the airway. 
asthma, you get inflammation of the brain, you get inflammation of the thyroid. So there's, in fact, there's probably not a single organ that escapes this inflammatory or autoimmune effect of the various components of, of modern wheat. Well, you know, I'll make this point. The inflammatory, the health-destroying effects of modern, modern wheat are so far-reaching that I ask, what are we doing in healthcare? Are we treating consumption of modern wheat? So, so let's talk about what happens. What happens when we take this stuff out? If this is, if there's even the least bit of truth in all this, well, well let's. The, the, the experiment's easy, right? If if you're your little experiment with a, a subject of one, how do you find out? Well, you try it yourself, right? Um, so what happens when you take wheat out of the diet? It ain't an easy thing to do. If you take wheat out of the diet and you look at the food, you're going you're gonna to say to me, well, you know what? It's not as easy as I thought because wheat is in everything, right? It's in Twizzlers. It's the second ingredient. You ever know she can't eat just one? Yeah, I'm going to have just one. Just two. Okay, three. Okay, I'll exercise more tomorrow, and I'll cut my calories and fat, and I'll have the bag, right? <laughs> Campbell's tomato soup, taco seasoning, all frozen dinners, cereals, granola bars, you name it, wheat's there. Now, why would that be? Now, I, I'm going to, so we've talked about science so far, but I'm going to resort now to raw speculation. Let me ask a question. Now, wait a minute here. 1960, you and I go up and down the supermarket aisles. We ask, what foods contain wheat? It's pretty obvious, right? It's going to be in bread and pancake mix and uh, breadcrumbs. 2012, we go up and down the aisles. We ask, what foods contain wheat? We see it in pancake mix and bread, right? But we see it in the Twizzlers, soup mixes, salad dressings, virtually every... Why? Why is it... Well, is it necessary for taste and texture, or is it there to stimulate your appetite and to stimulate sales? I have no proof of that, but it sounds awfully conspiracy theorist. I know it does. Um, but why in the world is wheat in virtually every processed food? And of course, this does not mean gluten-free. This was never about gluten-free. So it's going gluten-free is a good thing. Okay, it, you, because you avoid gluten, you avoid wheat, you avoid gliadin, right? Naturally, you avoid wheat germ agglutinin, you avoid the amylopectin A, so you avoid all those nasty things in modern wheat. But we have people who say, well, chief, I'm going to be gluten free, I'm going to eat gluten free foods. Well, what did, what did the food manufacturers choose as their replacements for wheat flour? They, they choose rice starch, corn starch, tapioca starch, or potato starch, okay? Among the only foods that raise blood sugar higher than even the amylopectin A of wheat. That doesn't make any sense, right? So, uh, yeah, it is good to be gluten-free, but we eat no commercial gluten-free foods, at least as they're currently conceived. There's going to be a time, I think, soon, where you and I can actually buy healthy gluten-free foods. That time hasn't really yet arrived. No manufacturer is, is distributing nationally, but we're getting there. But right now, nobody, nobody should be eating gluten-free foods unless you understand that they're no better than jelly beans. So what happens? If, this is, if there's any truth at all to this, if we, if we buy this notion that the gliadin protein of wheat is an appetite stimulant via its, via its opiate binding effects. If we buy this notion that wheat germ agglutinin is a direct intestinal toxin and causes body-wide inflammation, uh, if we buy any, all this stuff, what happens when you take wheat out of the diet? Well, there's weight loss. There's rapid weight loss. There's some of it's water because if you lose inflammation, you do lose water, but you do lose fat very rapidly. It's not uncommon to see seven, eight pounds uh, in two weeks, 10 pounds, even 15 pounds in two weeks. I've seen many people lose 18, 20 pounds in a month. It slows down. It doesn't continue on that course forever, but uh, you can lose a lot of weight. Now, notice I never said to anybody, cut your calories, right? I never said, you know, push the plate away, cut your fat, cut, no, no, no. Lose the wheat, lose the appetite stimulant.
Okay, that's the crucial point here. It's not the calories. It's not the carbohydrates necessarily. It's, it's the appetite stimulating effect of the gliadin protein of wheat. So you lose weight. You have this wonderful relief from appetite. So that constant hungry at 9 after a breakfast at 7, hungry at 11 after your snack at 9, counting the minutes till lunchtime, hungry at 2, that, that, that grazing after dinner, all that stuff goes away, just like it used to be, the old days, where people would just eat, they'd sate themselves on that wild boar they caught, uh, and then be, not be hungry for a day or two. So that's what happens to your appetite. Appetite ratchets down dramatically. This notion of eat many small meals all throughout the day every two hours? No, 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 no. No human was meant to do that. And food obsessions and people susceptible to them go away. I've had a lot of people who had, for instance, bulimia and, and, and um, uh, binge eating disorder who have 24-hour day food obsessions. They can't shake them, can't stop them, wake up in the middle of the night, they still are thinking about food, they can't help themselves, so they, they, they binge, they go in private, right? lose it, they lose their teeth over it. This is a, it's, it's a life-destroying, relationship-destroying uh, disease, but their food obsessions go away, not all the time, but in many of them, when they lose the wheat. They lose the gliadin protein of wheat. There's a blood sugar reduction. That's real easy, right? The amylopectin A goes away. The gliadin effect of stimulating appetite goes away. You lose weight, blood sugar goes down. I have lots and lots of former diabetics who started with insulin and three drugs who are on nothing now with better blood sugars and A1Cs than they had on drugs. Joint pain we talked about, mostly fingers and wrists goes away. I am seeing, as this experience gets longer and longer, I am seeing more and more people say things like my low back pain, my knee pain, my hip pain. It took six months, but it's, it's getting better. I don't think if you had bone on bone arthritis in your, in, in your hip, it's going to regrow bone. I, I, I can't, we can't say that. But I think what it does is it removes the inflammatory response that's on top of that bone on bone irritation. So I think it makes you feel better. But if you get 50% relief with no Vioxx, Celebrex, or Naproxen, well, gee, I'll take it. Uh, if you measure inflammatory measures, they go down. Blood pressure goes down. Not right away. It takes a few weeks or months because as you lose weight, you mobilize all those fatty acids from your tummy into the bloodstream. And it keeps your blood pressure up as it does blood, blood sugar at first. Then they all drop over time. Uh, in a cholesterol panel, your triglycerides go down. H2 goes way up. Uh, small LDL particles, the number one cause for heart disease in the U.S. today, drops like a stone. It ain't high cholesterol, by the way. High cholesterol is a fiction. It's a convenience of measurement. It served the drug industry very, very well to the tune of $27 billion a year. So it, yeah, we don't say it drops cholesterol. It drops small LDL particles, okay, very effectively. I, I, I do this every day. It can drop small LDL particles from 1,800 nanomoles per liter down to zero. Uh, you have more energy. Your sleep is better. Your mood is better. Your thinking is clearer. Acid reflux, gone in easily over 90% of people. The bowel urgency of irritable bowel syndrome, very It's an uncommon person who says, I went wheat-free and didn't get relief. Most people get substantial relief. So what does that mean? If you're going to get rid of wheat, and we're going to reject this, this growing notion of gluten-free foods, what do you eat? Well, Real single ingredient foods, just like people used to do. Okay, we eat vegetables, that is the plant, the products of plants. We eat nuts, all you want. And by the way, I don't worry about fat. We don't cut our fat. I don't cut the meat, the, the fat off our meat. I don't throw away the skin on the chicken. That's good fat. It's good calories, good fat. If you're a starving human living in the savannah, do you say, I'm not going to eat that bit of fat. I haven't eaten in three weeks, but I'm not going to eat that fat. Um, I'm just going to eat that lean part. You're going to eat that animal. Hoof, hindquarters, heart, <laughs> bone marrow, right? <laughs> we eat meats, we eat eggs, and don't throw the yolk away. Eat the yolks. Eat five a day if you like. Have oils. Don't be frightened of oils. Oils are good for you. Not all oils. We don't eat hydrogenated oils, of course. We don't eat polyunsaturated oils. Uh, and fried oils we, we avoid. Um, uh, dairy is a little bit of uncertainty for some people, but in general, don't be, uh, certainly don't avoid dairy because it has fat in it. Uh, so it's a return to real single ingredient foods. Now I get this. I, I take care of real human beings in the office. and People say, well, that's all fine, but what about 
that party I was going to have on Saturday? How about the Packer party I was going to throw on Sunday? How about uh, holidays? Where am I supposed to put on my turkey? So in a, in a real world, yeah, it'd be wonderful. All we did was eat real single ingredient foods. But I've also, you know, one of, the, one of the things I also do is show you how to recreate common everyday fun foods like cupcakes and pizza and cakes and pecan streusel coffee cake. So you can make reasonable facsimiles that are tasty, fun, and healthy, healthy, uh, that are wheat-free, sugar-free, and don't have all the health consequences of their wheat-containing counterparts. And if anybody wants those recipes, there's 35 in the book, but I, I put them on my blog, the Wheat Belly blog. Uh, the blog is miserably uh, disorganized. So if you're thinking about a recipe, enter a search. If you want to, if you want to search, say, for brownies, put brownies in your search, you'll find the recipe for brownies. These are very, I make them. I'm not a chef. I'm not a gourmet. I just want to eat good things. And so uh, when my 14-year-old says, hey, how about some pizza? That's how I do it. And then you'll find those recipes on the blog. Okay, that's all I had to say. I believe we reserve some time for, for yeah. questions. Yes, we have time for a few questions. Can you eat Ezekiel Warrior? Wait for the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, Can you eat Ezekiel Bread? Um, well, uh, of course, I'm not going to stand uh, at your kitchen door and watch what you eat, so I'm not going to stop anybody from eating these things. But I would say, should you eat Ezekiel bread? I would say, <laughs> I would say absolutely not. So if I take high-yield semi-dwarf wheat, I take the seeds and I soak them and let them sprout, right? We still have gliadin. We still have gluten. We still have amylopectin A at a lower level because of the sprouting process, we still have wheat germ and gluten. In other words, it's if I told you, hey, I got a cigarette. It's got 20% less tar and nicotine. Is it better? Well, yeah, it's, but it's just less bad, right? So uh, that's the game we've been playing in nutrition. Uh, nutrition is not a science. It's fairy tales most of the time. And yeah, it's better, but it's really just less bad. You're going to find this many, many times in nutrition. Organic is better. No, it's just less bad. That is of wheat. Organic is a good concept, but in wheat in particular, it's just less bad. So no matter what you do to modern wheat, it remains modern wheat, right? How concerned do you have to be with prescription drugs and their content of wheat? And where could you check out resources to find out if there is wheat in prescription drugs? Yeah, it, that's kind of tough. Uh, so there are, there is wheat hidden in many things. Uh, this tends to be an issue only for the truly very sensitive. So a lot of people, yeah, we don't want the gliden, appetite stimulation, the high blood sugar, et cetera. But the tiny quantities in pills are really only issues for the truly very sensitive. But it, it is worth at least knowing if your pills have wheat in some form in them. Uh, there is a database, I'm blanking on the name, if you put um, um, uh, gluten, gluten and your, your drug name, gluten and Zyprexa, gluten and uh, Lamotyl, whatever, do the search and you'll come either to the manufacturer's website and or that website that I'm blanking on and it will tell you if there's any wheat in there. Um, there really is not a really great database. So, you know, that's one of the things I think we probably should do so people have that uh, and it's confident. It changes too. And you, you could call the manufacturer, but the nice lady on the other end often has no idea what you're talking about. So it's not, you can try it, doesn't hurt, but don't be surprised if you don't get a productive answer. But the, <clears throat> your best bet is to look at the uh, information from the manufacturer. And you know what? One of the things that Wheat Belly and the, glu the gluten-free movement have done is raise awareness. So it is becoming more, um, a lot of the manufacturers are putting them in the package insert, putting them in their information. So it's becoming a little easier. So even in the last couple of years, it's becoming a lot easier.
what's the uh, possibility of, say, substituting cornbread or something for regular bread? Or uh, how about rice to, as, as a, using that as a starch instead of something with wheat in it? Well, my preference is healthy, right? It's, it's let's, let's be healthy. So what happens, so if we replace wheat flour and all its terrible effects with cornstarch, rice starch, tapioca starch, or potato starch, those are the very common flours used in gluten-free foods, but also in other foods like, like cornbreads and, and rices, those things tend to raise blood. Here, here's, here's another part of this conversation. So you and I have lived through 40 years of overexposure to carbohydrates, right? Remember when Swanson TV dinners came out? And mom says, hey, I don't have to cook. I just got to shove this thing in the oven, take it out 30 minutes later, and give it to the kids. Done. Uh, we had tricks and Cocoa Puffs. And mom puts peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on white bread with ho-hos, ding-dongs, and scooter pies. And then uh, uh, we get older. We have Raisin Bran, Wheat checks, And I cut my fat, eat only healthy whole grains. What have we done with 40 years of that? We have burned out our pancreases. Okay, so our pancreatic function is no longer what it used to be. So it's not uncommon to get to your 40, 40, 50, 60 years old and have 75% residual pancreatic beta cell function to produce insulin. So an apple to a lot of adults now gives them diabetic or near diabetic blood sugars. A banana, a whole banana, gives you a near diabetic or diabetic blood sugars. So if I said you eliminate wheat, you have and you do it, that is a big step. But if you say, but yeah, that's good, I feel better, I've lost 28 pounds, but I want ideal health, and I don't want those high blood sugars, well then most people, not everybody, do better by also curtailing all those carbohydrates because of this legacy of high carbohydrate eating for 40, 50 years. So most people, most adults, you know, if you're a 20, clearly you're not a 22-year-old premenopausal uh, marathon runner. So maybe she doesn't have to, but most of us have to and you're better off cutting those rapidly digested carbohydrates. Where can you get in? <laughs> Is there any amount of wheat that's acceptable? <laughs> you know, that's actually a very good question because it's a very common uh, uh, dilemma. I would say no. Uh, but, but here, let me tell you why. So about 40% of people, so let's say you've been wheat free for uh, four weeks, about 40% of people will say, what the heck, I've been good, right? Uh, or you didn't know it, and it was in your whatever, right? And you have it, next thing you have is, is mind fog, anxiety, asthma, diarrhea, uh, bloating. Uh, in other words, you get rash. So there are very common re-exposure reactions. So if I have wheat now, I been, I've been wheat-free for years. If I have wheat now, I get that GI distress. I can't think straight. I, I, I truly can't function for about 48 hours. So for me, it's not worth it. Now, how about somebody who says, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. I have two slices of bread. And I was over my in-laws and I had, and that's what she was serving. And I felt fine. Yeah, you felt fine, but not everything is perceived. So high blood sugars, the glide in opiate effect that stimulates appetite. You go home and you get hungry. Man, I'm still hungry. So uh, even though you may not perceive effects, this stuff is so powerful uh, that it has. You know, I, an analogy for you is I, I have a restaurant. It's a nice restaurant. But we're kind of sloppy about washing our hands after we use the bathroom. And we don't really like to clean off the counter after we cut some raw chicken. And so 90% of the time you eat my restaurant, this is make believe, I don't have a restaurant. 90% uh, of the time you eat my restaurant, uh, you'll be fine. But 10% of the time you're gonna have some staphylococcus in your kitchen, in your chicken. Or you're gonna have some E. coli in your salad, okay? Would you eat at my restaurant if I offered it for free? I don't think so. So uh, with those low odds, I don't think it's worth it. So cutting back for, in other words, if I said, uh, just eat at my restaurant once a month, you could still get sick. So I, I just don't, this stuff, when you see the effects, I've done this now many thousands of times, when you see the effects of removing it entirely, you start to realize this is not just a little bit bad, 
It's really bad stuff. You know, I think if this was 1950, we couldn't have this conversation. I think you would say, yeah, I took all the wheat out of my diet. Uh, I lost three pounds, big deal. I think that's what we would say. But this is 2012, and the wheat we have today is very different. I think that's what we're talking about to a large degree. That is, we remove this thing called modern wheat, and that's why we see these extravagant effects. It's a modern phenomenon. Okay, sure. Uh, you, you have convinced me I'm not eating at your restaurant. <clears throat> but what do you do about eating out? Uh, yeah, it's becoming easier. It's become much easier thanks to the popularity of these no, of these ideas. Uh, so you, you're safe if you order most salads. Ask the croutons to be set aside. You're you're fine with most meats, of course. You might. It, it's a good habit to get into. Ask, is this breaded? That, I, I've stumbled. But I forgot to ask, and the chicken. Ah, oh, it's breaded. Um, but it is becoming a lot easier. Go for the simplest foods, the foods that have the more complex sauces and preparation are the ones that have might, might have a little bit, and you're among them very sensitive, it can, you can have a reaction. Uh, so go for salads, go for the meats. Um, desserts are a problem. You will have trouble with desserts. You might have to restrict yourself to the fruit um, or to the simplest desserts. Uh, I, I've been traveling a lot for this, uh, for the book. I can tell you it's gotten a lot easier. I was in Calgary two weeks ago, and the staff were incredibly accommodating. I was, I was shocked. Now, they were trying to replace the wheat rolls with gluten-free rolls, but you know, that may not be perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. So I think it's becoming easier, but it, it, it pays to be vigilant. You can't rely on wait staff often. You know, that nice kid often doesn't know, uh, and you have to make a nuisance of yourself. Uh, I would say if you're among those people who have per perceived problems, like those severe gastrointestinal distress, if in doubt, don't eat it. It's just not worth it. Is that okay? He's been waiting. Yes, doctor, I, I read your book and I very much enjoyed it and I've been passing it around. Um, one question I had is uh, Europeans have a diet high in uh, um, pasta and bread and yet don't, as of yet, have our obesity. Uh, is there a reason for that? And my second question is, um, is, is drinking beer as bad as eating a loaf of bread? <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it, it, it varies from, na from country to country. So the issues in France are different from the issues in Malaysia, are different from the issues in uh, Beijing, right? So it's gonna vary from, from location to location. Uh, uh, several issues. The French, for instance, who are thinner, and by the way, they're catching up to us. They're, they're not all skinny. They are getting fatter. As they adopt our habits, have more fat. They have, more, they have less heart disease. They, have, they eat more fat. So the, a lot of fat, like butter and the, the fat on your meat, blunts some of these carbohydrate effects because it's very satiating, right? The French do eat bread, but they don't eat in the quantities we have, and they don't consume the bulk of processed foods like we do. So they don't have breakfasts of, of breakfast cereal. They don't have um, granola bars, all these processed versions of wheat flour. So they do have wheat in their croissants and their rolls, etc. But they don't have the same kind of exposure that we have. Um, in Asia, the wheat exposure is actually rather small. They have more rice, of course, like in Japan, but they have less of a wheat exposure. Uh, like soba noodles might be a little bit wheat. It's mostly buckwheat. Uh, so there's a lesser exposure to wheat. There, there's probably also differences. This is a little bit tough to, to winnow out, though. Difference among what are called cultivars, strains of wheat. So there may be forms that are much worse than others. I think we probably have the worst form here in Canada. But there may be more benign forms. Not entirely benign, but less harmful strains of wheat elsewhere. There may be also issues with preparation. So there's probably lots and lots of differences. We'd have to go on a nation by nation base to fully understand the issues. But I think it is an issue for the world because it's not just about weight, of course, right? The explosion in diabetes, for instance, is a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, it's not affecting Ethiopia, but it's affecting virtually all other uh, modern nations, uh, 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 developed nations. So. Uh, it is not just a matter of weight also. There are other health problems. There's been an explosion of celiac disease, for instance. I try to avoid talking about celiac disease, but it is kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? If we have an explosion of celiac disease, we know there's something wrong with the wheat, 
And there's been a quadrupling of celiac disease in the US and Canada. And this is also true in Europe. So it's not like we're the only ones exposed. To this. It is a worldwide phenomenon. With the beer, uh, you know, I fear, I worry about that glide in effect. That is that appetite stimulating mind fog uh, effect, things that affect your mind. And so my, I think you're best off not drinking wheat-based beers. Now, this is not a gluten-free conversation. So malt is probably not the issue that is for the people who do it because they have celiac disease. So the malt is probably not a big deal. Uh, Bud Light is, is wheat-free. Michelob Ultra is wheat-free. And low-carb, by the way. 2.6 grams carbs per 12 ounces. There are, you know, some of the... Um, some of the uh, microbreweries are coming out with some interesting wheat-free beers, but they tend to be very carb-heavy. There's Red Bridge made by Anheuser-Busch. I think it has about 16 grams carbohydrates per 12-ounce bottle, which now, now we're getting kind of high in carbohydrates. And by the way, and this often comes, up, often comes up, how many carbohydrates can I tolerate? Well, it differs, right? If you're a 300-pound sedentary diabetic truck driver or a 22-year-old uh, um, premenopausal 105 pound marathon runner, you have two very different tolerances to carbohydrates. But speaking generally, most adults can tolerate about 15 grams uh, net carbohydrates uh, per meal or per sitting. Net meaning uh, total carbohydrates minus fiber. They count fiber as a carbohydrate, you can subtract that part. So 15 grams or so, most we can tolerate. So if, if Red Bridge beer has 16 grams net per 12 ounce bottle, we're starting to toe that line, right? You have three, ooh, ooh, you're really way over, and you have blood sugar effects. Who are you close to win? Thank you, doctor. <clears throat> You've addressed and made us much more aware of wheat. Has anybody addressed the uh, effects of uh, genetically modified corn? Yeah. Well, you know, this is really, so uh, wheat's a problem. Did you catch that? <laughs> but you know what? There's more problems. And the wheat issue is really part of a much bigger issue. And that is agribusiness sees fit to change our food. Well, that's fine. Except that you ought to tell us, right? You ought to put it on the label. You ought to give us some information. You ought to do some testing beforehand. And the problem is none of that is currently done. So... Uh, you know, so companies like Monsanto, of course, uh, released glyphosate-resistant corn, Roundup-ready corn. So you folks know what that is? It's, okay, so it's corn, you can, the farmer can spray Roundup or glyphosate on. It kills the weeds, but not the corn. Well, Monsanto's been selling it for a decade, right? They've been telling us it's just fine. Well, now the data is being generated not by Monsanto, by other organizations showing us it ain't so fine. That French study from about four weeks ago where the rats were fed glyphosate-resistant corn versus traditional corn, I'll tell you real quick. So, so rats fed traditional corn lived normal two-year long rat lives. The uh, glyphosate corn, glyphosate-resistant corn fed rats died younger of large tumors, mostly of the breast. Now this is corn. This is not radiation. It's not chemotherapy. It's corn. So uh, that's just one study but conducted for two years. So we have other data. So it's all bashed by agribusiness. Uh, and of course, you know, there's Proposition 37 in front of California right now. And there is the Truth and Labeling Act in front of Congress that stalled for over two and a half years. So what's happened is, so last I checked my bank account, I don't have $2 billion in there. So they have incredible resources to fight these initiatives. So I think virtually all, everybody in the public says, we want, if you're going to change it, we're not going to shut you down. We're not going to fine you or penalize you. You just tell us if you did it so we can make our own choices. But the, even that simple uh, concession is not being given to us. So what we have to do is we have to raise a stink. And of course, easiest thing of all, vote with your wallet or pocketbook. And if you think something has been genetically modified, which is going to be grains for the most part, right? Wheat and corn and soy, don't buy it. Uh, buy foods. You know what the best food is? That tomato you grow, grow on your vine in your backyard. Reach out from your kitchen window. Grow, the basil plant sitting on your windowsill. The farmer, right? You know, you know how he raises his pigs. Or the farmer's market. So that's, that's a way to avoid uh, a lot of that nonsense. On that good advice, let's thank our speaker.